Our Lord has assembled us here together this morning for a purpose, and that is to worship Him for who He is and for what He's done for us, and we do that by many means, and so now we come to worship our Lord uh, by the public reading of Scripture. So open in your Bibles with me to Lamentations chapter 3, and uh, if you haven't turned there in a while, it's right after the book of Jeremiah. It's, uh, we've taken this morning what I would consider to be a familiar text from a foreign book, and so let me say before I read just a, a couple of words of introduction. Uh, Jeremiah probably wrote the book of Lamentations, and I say probably because uh, in our version of the book of Lamentations, he's not noted as an author, but in Second Chronicles chapter 35, verse 25, when King Josiah died, uh, this is what the book reads. Jeremiah also uttered a lament for Josiah, and all the singing men and singing women have spoken of Josiah in their laments to this day. They made these a rule in Israel. Behold, they are written in the laments. And many have taken this to be a direct reference in Scripture to the book of Lamentations. Um, maybe it is. Uh, Jeremiah certainly wrote in this genre. There are strong links between the book of Lamentations and the book of Jeremiah, and church tradition affirms it. Uh, when the Hebrew Bible groups Lamentations with Ruth and Song of Songs and the book of Esther, uh, the Greek version of the Old Testament groups it with Jeremiah, as we have it, uh, because in their prologue, they have this. This happened. Uh, referring to the events of the book of Lamentations. After Israel was taken captive and Jerusalem was devastated, Jeremiah sat down weeping and he wailed this lament over Jerusalem and said the following laments. Uh, my position is that Jeremiah probably wrote it. Um, so if you hear me refer to the poet in the sermon, I'm not taking a stand against Jeremiah's authorship. And each chapter of this book is arranged according to an acrostic form, meaning each line begins with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet from Aleph to Tav all the way down. Each chapter then has 22 verses, except for chapter 3, which has 66 verses because each letter is repeated three times. Uh, as we come to chapter 3, we come to the heart of this book, both because of its elaborate form and its context. So we've taken verses 19 through 24 for the text, but I will read verses 1 through 24 now. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me his hand turns again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with blocks of stones. He has made my paths crooked. He is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a target for his arrow. He drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. I have become a laughingstock of all peoples, the object of their taunts all day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance has perished. So has my hope from the Lord. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. 
His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. Let's pray. Well, a man by the name of Thomas Chisholm wrote that hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Taking Lamentations chapter 3, verse 23 as the jumping off point for his poetic verse in that song, Chisholm wanted to attest to what he called the morning by morning realization of God's personal faithfulness. He wrote, My income has not been large at any time due to impaired health in the earlier years, which has followed me until now. Evidently writing this in, later in his life. Although, I must not fail to record here the unfailing faithfulness of a covenant-keeping God, and that He has given me wonderful displays of His providing care, for which I am filled with astonishing gratefulness. Those are the words of the hymn writer Thomas Chisholm, and that testimony fits the truth of this text. However, the writer of Lamentations was not facing merely economic and uh, physical impairment. He was facing the upending of his entire life. His whole livelihood, even his homeland, uh, was in a wreck. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. Judah has gone into exile. Lamentations 1.1. That's the situation in the background of this book. After King Nebuchadnezzar deported groups of people from Judah to Babylon in the years 605 and 597 B.C., his third and final attack culminated in the year 586 B.C. It was during the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, that King Nebuchadnezzar came with all his army against Jerusalem and laid siege to it, and they built siege works all around it. They encompassed the city cutting off all supply lines and disallowing anyone from going out or coming in. After a year and a half of that, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. It was at that point that the men of Judah, including King Zedekiah, made a breach in the wall and tried to make an escape. But the Babylonians pursued and captured the king, ruthlessly slaughtering his sons before gouging out his eyes. Soon thereafter, they entered Jerusalem, burnt the temple of the Lord, and took all the precious stones and metals back to Babylon with them. These were nightmarish circumstances. And the book of Lamentations makes no mistake about it. This affliction was a punishment coming directly from the Lord according to His covenant with them. The Lord has afflicted Jerusalem for the multitude of her transgressions. The poet confessed to the Lord, Lamentations 1.21, you have brought the, the day you announced. And again, the Lord has done what He purposed. He has carried out His word, which He commanded long ago. The word that the Lord commanded long ago is found in the covenant curses of the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. The Lord told His people, if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all His commandments and His statutes that I am commanding you today, then the Lord will bring you and your King whom you set over you to a nation that neither you nor your fathers have known. Great is thy faithfulness, not only to bless according to promise, but also to curse. That's the situation of our poet in the book of Lamentations. So he writes in verses 19 and 20, Remember my affliction and my wandering." The wormwood and the gall, my soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. Having written about the city of Jerusalem in the third person, that is, the city of Jerusalem uh, personified as a lady, writing about her in the third person. Now, in chapter 3, he writes in the first person. He did not describe these events as a distant spectator, but as a sympathizer with every sufferer in the city. And in Lamentations 3, he's Jerusalem's representative in suffering. He speaks on her behalf. 
The experience of every exile is summed up in him. So that in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. The Lord made him taste affliction, homelessness, bitter wormwood and gall. And immersed in his state of suffering, the poet's mind was fixed on his circumstances. Verse 20, my soul continually remembers it. Or surely my soul remembers it and is bowed down within me. These circumstances had a grip on this man's soul. And if you've experienced grief or affliction, a kind that you continually remember, you know how exhausting it is. It can feel like the subject of your trouble commands your thoughts so that the the wheels of your mind are always spinning. And so he wrote, my soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is, so I say, my endurance has perished, and so is my hope from the Lord. He was at the end of his rope, and it seemed there was no way forward. Notice I said, it seemed that there was no way forward. In fact, there was. Even in the darkness and bitterness of his suffering, there was a light to be seen and a sweetness to be tasted. This I call to mind, he wrote in verse 21. Or literally, this I cause to return to my mind, and therefore I have hope. When his soul continually remembered his affliction, he actively set his mind on the truth of God's word. These these are truths that he already learned, but his circumstances threatened to eclipse them, to cover them up, to take them out of view. But he didn't let that happen. Instead, he applied the truth that he already knew to his current situation. He used old truth in a new trial. He preached to himself. And as the sympathizer and spokesperson for his contemporaries, as the man who has seen affliction, he set an example for them to imitate. How should the exiles respond in their current circumstance? This poem illustrates the way. In the midst of their distress, they needed to preach to themselves. And so do you. This is a timeless example set up in the Word of God for you to imitate. Preach to yourself. During your sojourn through this state of present suffering unto future glory, be preaching to yourself. Call to mind the truth of God's Word. Use old truth in the new trials of life. That's the central application of this text for us today. And in verse 22 through 24, the Lord has provided us with a wonderful portrait of what preaching to ourselves can look like. So in verses 22 and 23, we see the content that we should be preaching to ourselves. And finally, in verse 24, we see the consequence of preaching to ourselves. So first of all, the content that you should preach to yourself is the unchanging truth of the gospel. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. When the poet wrote, this I call to mind, the this of verse 24, 21 refers to what's here in verses 22 and 23. He called to mind the unceasing, steadfast love of the Lord. He called to mind the unending and ever fresh mercies of the Lord. He called to mind the great faithfulness of the Lord. And these are attributes of God that he already knew, but his circumstances falsely conveyed the notion that they had run out. Maybe God has been loving, faithful, and merciful in the past. But those blessings have run out. We've exhausted them. 
He waged war on that thought. Though all his circumstances in the short term might have indicated otherwise, surely the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Surely his mercies never come to an end. Something important for us to understand as we read these verses is that he viewed these attributes of the Lord as they were revealed by the concrete works of the Lord for his people. What I mean by that is that he had in mind specific instances in history where he saw the steadfast love, mercy, and faithfulness of God made manifest in his redemptive works for his people. That's why these terms in verse 22 are plural. He looked back on the Lord's past works of faithfulness and expected the same in the present and in the future. He looked back to move forward. Now let me illustrate this before we move on. My family and I take walks on the trail at White Rock Lake. From time to time, there are rowing teams practicing on the lake. And if you ever go out there for a walk and see them, you can take a seat on the grass under a cypress tree and watch them work. The sight is familiar. Floating atop the sparkling greenish-brown water of White Rock Lake <laughs> is a team of several young men or women lined up on their boat, facing backward, with their hands gripping the handles of their blades, and usually the rowing team is accompanied by a small motorboat with a coach barking commands through a megaphone. Now, if you're one of the rowers on the boat and say you begin on the north side of the lake in the cove, uh, what you have in your line of sight before you is a footbridge that crosses the lake and a dog park to your left. But if you and the team rode all the way to the south end of the lake, eventually you would see things like the Dallas Arboretum on your right. The point is, rowers look back to go forward. That's an illustration that others have used to portray the perspective of the biblical writers on history. To quote from a, a standard theological dictionary on the Old Testament on this point, Humankind experiences time, as does a rower in a boat who moves into the future backwards. He reaches his goal by taking his bearings from what is visibly in front of him, and it is in this revealed history that for him the Lord of the future is attested. That's our writer in Lamentations 3. In the midst of the swirling waters of his distress and suffering, he was like a rower in a boat, looking back to go forward. While there may have been multiple objects in his line of sight as he looked back, two of them, chiefly, were very prominent. And the first one is this. He looked back to move forward as he was looking at the covenant loyalty of the Lord God revealed in the first exodus. And I say that because the wording of verses 22 and 23 alludes to Exodus, chapter 34, verse 6. And in the background of Exodus, chapter 34, was a situation not unlike the writer's own. The people of Israel had grievously sinned against the Lord by worshiping the golden calf. And they were facing the prospect of severe consequences for it. The Lord threatened to withdraw His special presence from His people, and though they could go forward without Him, he said he would not go up among them, lest he consume them on the way. The people could uh, go ahead, but the Lord would not go with them. But Moses interceded for the people, pleading with the Lord to have favor on them. Finding favor with the Lord, the favor that he desired, Moses then asked the Lord, please show me your glory. And finding that favor that he desired, the Lord put Moses in the cleft of a rock on this mountain and passed by him. And he said this, The Lord, the Lord, 
a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. Notice the three attributes of the Lord from Lamentations 3. Steadfast love, mercy, and faithfulness. Not only was this a wonderful answer to Moses' request to know the Lord, to see His glory, it was also a renewal of hope for God's people. The Lord would remain in His covenant with Israel in spite of their faithlessness because of His own unceasing loyalty, because of His unchanging, steadfast love, mercy, and faithfulness. And our text is not the only one that alludes to that in the Old Testament. It comes up repeatedly over and over again. For example, in the great confession of sin found in Nehemiah chapter 9, the people confess as they look back on their forefathers, saying this, They refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them, but they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. And again, when David was preaching to himself in Psalm 103, urging himself, Bless the Lord, O my soul. He recalled this truth. The Lord made known His ways to Moses, His acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. I could enumerate even more examples, but I trust that the point is clear. The first object in the poet's line of sight as he's looking back to move forward is the Lord's covenant loyalty revealed in the first exodus. But he didn't only call to mind the reality of the first exodus. He also uh, looked back to the promise of a new exodus and a new covenant. He was convinced that the steadfast love and mercies of the Lord are new every morning. For one thing, this meant that these precious attributes of God were inexhaustible because they were renewed daily. But for another thing, and even more so, this conviction of ever fresh mercy from the Lord, it was rooted in the promise of God that exile was not the end of the story all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 30, the Lord anticipated a new exodus through a new covenant. The Lord said to His people from the beginning of their existence as a nation, knowing full well that they would break the covenant, when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and when you call them to mind among the nations where the Lord has driven you, then the Lord said He would restore and gather them from the nations to which they were scattered. He went on to promise them, and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. The Lord would lead His people in a new exodus through a new covenant. And this truth is revealed with even more clarity in Jeremiah chapter 31, of course. Just as surely as the sun, moon, and stars were fixed in their order, so also would the Lord forgive the sins of His people, write His law on their hearts, and be their covenant God. In other words, the steadfast love and mercies of the Lord are new every morning. Just as surely as the reliable rays of warmth rise with the morning sun, so will the smile of the Lord's covenant-keeping loyalty. Even in the dark night of exile, the poet knew dawn was coming. That's because the ceaselessly loving, merciful, and faithful Lord of the covenant said that it would. Here's the point. The content 
that he preached to himself consisted not only of the covenant loyalty of the Lord revealed in the first exodus, but also the promise of a coming new exodus through a new covenant. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That's our example to imitate. Like him, and like the rowers on the lake, we should look back to move forward. And as we do, we need to acknowledge that we are further down the stream of history than this man was as he wrote. As we look back, we have more in view than he did. Much of what was yet in the future for him is in the past and in the present from our perspective. While we still look back to Moses in the first exodus, now we see Christ and the new exodus that has already begun in him. By shedding his blood on the cross, Christ began the new covenant. As the poet looked back, he saw Moses. As we look back, we see Christ. And what a gift it is to see Christ. In beholding Christ, we come to this passage of Scripture, seeing a truth that uh, the writer couldn't have seen. He not only set an example for us to imitate in his suffering, he also foreshadowed the one through whom the fulfillment of his hope would come. He foreshadowed the Lord Jesus, who is the man who has seen affliction. Under the rod of God's wrath at the cross, Jesus could say, I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a target for his arrow. He drove into my kidneys the arrows of his quiver. I have become a laughing stock of all peoples, the object of their taunts all day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. We see Christ in the sufferer of Lamentations chapter 3. But there's a major difference between the two. The poet suffered with God's people as a fellow sinner. Jesus Christ suffered for God's people as a sinless sacrifice. The poet suffered with God's people as a fellow sinner but Jesus Christ has suffered for God's people as a sinless sacrifice. The poet wrote these laments as a fellow sinner with his people, but Christ can say them as a spotless sacrifice for his people. Do you see what this means? Christ is the man who has seen affliction under the rod of God's wrath in your place at the cross. Christ was driven into darkness without any light in your place at the cross. Christ was besieged and enveloped with bitterness and tribulation in your place at the cross. Christ was torn to pieces and desolated in your place at the cross. He took the arrows of God's wrath in your place at the cross, God's people. In the words of Isaiah chapter 53, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
Look back to the cross and see Christ crucified for you. But don't only look back to the cross and see Christ crucified. Look and see Him crucified and risen. Even as He went to the cross of His suffering, He knew the tomb was not the end of the story. As the mediator of your salvation, He could say with the lamenter, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. There is no more beautiful or eloquent portrait of the steadfast love, merciful, uh, mercy, and faithfulness of the Lord than the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look back to the cross. See the steadfast love, the mercy, and the great faithfulness of the Lord. See His covenant loyalty. And in your looking, conclude this, that God has not only been loyal to His covenant in the past, but will be unceasingly loyal now in the present and forever because He does not change. God is not a man that He should lie or a son of man that He should change His mind. Has He said and will He not do it? Has He spoken And will he not fulfill it? Follow the example of the poet and take these truths of the gospel. Preach them to yourself. The consequences are contentment in the present and hope for the future. Even in his deprivation, this man was content because he had the Lord. The Lord is my portion. Verse 24. The one who has preached the truth of the gospel to himself or herself is able to say that no matter the circumstance. It is to say with, to the Lord with David, You are my Lord. I have no good apart from You. It is to say to the Lord with Asaph, Whom have I in heaven but You? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides You. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Forever. To say the Lord is my portion is to be satisfied. It's to be content in Him. And this feeds hope for the future. He said, therefore, I will hope. Or therefore, I will wait. You know, the psalmist in Psalm 130 likens the believer's waiting to a night watchman on a city wall. Standing at his post on the wall, the watchman stays awake and keeps watch as he waits for the morning sun. Likewise, the believer says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in His Word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning. More than watchman for the morning. Through the night of suffering, the believer can wait hopefully on the Lord because of the indomitable promise that dawn is coming. His steadfast love and mercies are new every morning. The one who says, the Lord is my portion, can also say, I will hope in Him. Can you say that this morning? Can you? We ought to be a content and a hopeful people. So are we? If not, one reason is because we have room to grow in this discipline of preaching to ourselves. In order to grow in it, you need to know the truths of the gospel and be familiar with them in the first place. In our passage, the poet called back to mind the things that he already knew. Knowledge of the Gospel comes from reading, reading the Scriptures, praying, hearing the Word preached, fellowship in the life of the church, seeing the Word 
uh, illustrated and proclaimed in the Lord's Supper and in baptism. All of these are means by which we grow in our knowledge of the Lord and of the gospel. But the whole point of preaching to yourself is not bare knowledge. It's application. It's making use of the doctrine that you know in the gritty stuff of life. As Richard Baxter wrote, true doctrine must not be left in the porch or at the doors, but be brought home and used to its proper end, seated in the heart. It's true. Some of you are navigating a season of acute suffering at the moment. In the providence of God, you're facing severe injuries, ailments, and discouragement. And others are under the hand of God's loving, fatherly discipline. And it's proving to be painful in the moment rather than pleasant. And let me say on that, discipline is not the same thing as punitive wrath. The book of Lamentations is a specific context with specific covenant curses from the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. That we can make application here. Uh, to the Lord's fatherly discipline, but do not conflate the two. God's discipline is loving. He does not discipline those who are not His sons and daughters, but He disciplines those whom He loves. If that's you, you likely feel weak this morning and unable to take up afresh this discipline of preaching to yourself. I understand that. I understand. And so did the writer, more importantly, of this text. He said in verse 18, My endurance has perished. So is my hope from the Lord. But remember, he didn't look within himself for the strength to carry on. He looked back to move forward. In the midst of your distress, don't look inward for the strength to carry on. Look to Christ. Look to Christ. To quote Baxter again, remember that it is a far higher, nobler, sweeter work to think of God and Christ and heaven than of such worms as we ourselves are. When we go up to God, we go to love and light and liberty. But when we look down into ourselves, we look into a dungeon a prison, a wilderness, a place of darkness, horror, filthiness, misery, and confusion. In God and glory, there is nothing to discourage our thoughts, but all to delight them. The reason rowers face the back of their boats is so they can use the strength not only of their upper bodies, but also their legs. Likewise, we look back to move forward. That's where we see the person and work of Jesus Christ, the preeminent revelation of God's steadfast love, mercy, and faithfulness. That's where the power is. That's where the power is. You weary, depressed, and anxious saints, look to Christ. The Lord will content your heart in Himself, and He'll give you hope. And I need to be realistic with you. The Lord does not tell us how long it will take for us to feel content and hopeful. Not to be too trivial, but the poet did not say, this I call to mind and after a 45 minute quiet time, I have hope. Seriously. We don't get a timetable. I don't want to Uh, misdirect your expectations of what the Lord might do. It's up to the Spirit of God's grace to deal with you. I can't tell you how long it will take for you to feel content and hopeful in your distress. But I can tell you this on the authority of the Word of God. There is hope. This I call to mind. Therefore, I will hope. Others of you are not situated in a season of acute suffering. You're prospering under the blessing of God, and you're happy. 
That's not to be despised. That's to be embraced and enjoyed. If that's you, I don't want you closing your Bible and thinking there's no application for you. Prosperity is not to be expected because we deserve it. But it is to be enjoyed when God gives it. I would not encourage you to seek out suffering. The Apostle Paul is clear enough that we will all see suffering at some point. It is through tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. While comfort, encouragement, joy, and all the blessings of prosperity are gifts to be enjoyed, they can present a hazard that we must be watchful for. Spiritual laziness. Seasons of desperation are often the times when we experience the truth of our utter dependence upon the Lord the most. The most pointedly. But in times of prosperity, we can tend to depend more on ourselves or on the things that God gives rather than on the God who gives them and can take them away. This self-reliance lends itself to a spiritual laziness. And this is a sin to be killed. Even in your prosperity, you need to be preaching to yourself. Don't be lazy. By the grace of the Holy Spirit, put that sin to death and look to Christ. (laughs) Preach the wonders of His covenant loyalty to yourself and then proceed to enjoy the good things that He's given you not as ends in and of themselves, but as means to the end of savoring, of savoring His steadfast love, mercy, and faithfulness. And to you who uh, do not know this God of whom I speak, you will see the rod of His wrath. But there is hope if you embrace Christ, the man who has seen affliction. Embrace Him. Repent of your sin and hope in Him, not only for this life, but for the life to come. And you can enjoy with all of us the steadfast love, the mercy, and the faithfulness of this great covenant God. Let's pray. I'm sorry, let's sing hymn number 19. (laughs) I'll pray in a moment. It's number 19 in the songs of praise. Father, your word has been sown and we ask that you would give the increase, give it life by your spirit. Make us ready for the good works prepared for us to walk in this week and help us to be faithful, I pray. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.